thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul. Whatever thou be, until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan, Nightmare Fuel author. I'm Lindsay. <laughs> Hello, Lindsay. Hello, happy Valentine's. Hello, Valentine. <laughs> yeah, real quick on the Nightmare Fuel. Uh, thanks so much for all the, the kind feedback regarding the first episode. Um, saw it on socials and on uh, Patreon. Definitely inspires me to work on more stories. And uh, I will try to get this next one out faster so patrons get it a little earlier than they did this time. There was. Um, I, I did want to tell you, <laughs> there was like a lot of messages to me of like, oh, it's like not good, but should we just like... You know, oh, be yeah. nice to yeah, him. Nice. And I was like, yeah. Well, well thanks for the sympathy. Either, whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. JK. Um, yeah, I don't want to take up too much time to start about this episode, but do want to just address two things real quick. Uh, no, these episodes will not exist on YouTube, The Nightmare Fuel. Uh, I record them in, in a darkened room. Helps me get into the mood, and but it doesn't lend itself to uh, being, you know, uh, you just video. Be, yeah, you'd just be staring <laughs> yeah. at a blank screen. Uh-huh. <laughs> and and the stories will not be serialized. Uh, just little standalone stories that may, like there may be a character from one that shows up in another one later if it just happens to work out that way. But that's not necessarily like what I have in mind. Uh, but if the series goes well, then yes, this next podcast at some point, hopefully before the end of the year, it, it would be serialized. But these are like just little vignettes. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. And that's it. So, uh, yeah, for now, just happy that many of you uh, like the first one. And now I know Lindsay has some summer camp. I just info. have one quick uh, announcement right away, right off the top. Uh, we will be talking about summer camp, which is happening in September of 2025. Yeah. We're taking this year off just for a variety of reasons. Um, we... We are working through the legal pieces, so I don't have confirmed dates for you. I don't have confirmed on sale. Just hang tight. Uh, I know I've been talking about it in the Facebook Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp group. I'm trying to give enough heads up as we're starting to work through the details here. So just hang tight, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. Tickets are looking like they're going to go on sale at the end of March, like as in, you know, a month from now. Uh, well, six weeks approximately from when you're hearing this. So approximately the end of March this year, tickets on sale. And as we get closer and we have contracts locked down and all the legal things sorted out, we will come back to you with firm details. So just a little heads up. Don't bombard me with questions because I don't have answers right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're very excited to do that in 2025 and glad to have a little like buffer year to yeah more properly prepare. Yeah, I was telling Dan like there's another festival that I follow and they're also taking a year off to like regroup mm -hmm. and kind yeah. of. So um, thanks for being patient with us as we are just a small little team yeah. as we figure this out and, and learn how to lean on the actual camp to yeah. do a lot of the stuff that uh, we did previously. Yep. We just want to get it right. Get it right. Uh, how many stories do you have for this uh, essentially Valentine's Day episode, Lindsay Lou? This essential, essentially Valentine's Day, I have two. Uh, <laughs> my first story, oh, I love that. I didn't even write a note for myself. What is my second story about? That is hilarious. Uh, my first story is a uh, a fun family occurrence where everyone in the house knows that the house is haunted. So that is Super fun. Uh, and then my second story also has an element of like a family member confirming a roadside sighting. Okay. So, yeah. Like creepy stuff on the side of the road. Ugh. Uh, I have two. Neither one involve romance. Um, both are scary though, so that's good. Uh, first set in the beautiful South Pacific island nation of Micronesia. Mm -hmm. We'll visit one person's claim of what happened to them while doing some scuba diving amongst the World War II wreckage of Chuk Lagoon. Yeah. Literally have no desire to scuba dive. This will give you even less. Perfect. Uh, so many dead bodies are still laying out on the reef amongst Ugh. the wreckage of ships, planes, even tanks. Hundreds of them. Uh, so sad. Yeah, supposedly a very haunted underwater graveyard. After that, we're going to head back to Ohio. <gasps> to the little, Which is where I'm from. Just ask me. I'll tell you. <laughs> to the little town of Belair, Ohio, where the supposedly very haunted Belair house stands. Did a mining disaster and more lead to the home today being possibly infested with numerous entities? That is what the current owner believes. 
And now once you've showcased your uh, sweet, actually this week's spoopy socks. Wait, the love socks. <laughs> Uh, I'll jump into the first story. Okay, let's do it. This is posted by somebody who has chosen to remain anonymous. I'm not the first to have a supernatural experience under the water, and I won't be the last. Before I share my experience here, let me back up first. Since I was a kid, I've always loved exploring. Maybe exploring is an ambitious word for it. Since I grew up in the suburbs, there really wasn't much to explore except a wide expanse of flat gray streets, cookie cutter houses, and the occasional playground. But explore I did. I found my first treasures at construction sites, coins that had been long buried under concrete slabs, pieces of jewel-like glass, once even what looked like a diamond earring. Ooh. It wasn't cubic zirconia. I know because my mom had a test after lecturing me on how looking around on other people's property and taking what I found was tantamount to stealing. Oh. After that, I had to explore a little more discreetly. I definitely didn't stop. I was an explorer. Growing up, I read so many stories about explorers, Marco Polo, uh, Vasco da Gama, uh, who made it from Mozambique to, uh, to Mozambique from Portugal, Norwegian Roald Amundsen, Amundsen, who first navigated the North Pole. I dreamt of becoming as legendary, the first person to discover some new continent or a new ocean. Or when I found out those had definitely all been found, <laughs> maybe a secret passageway or hidden city or something. As I went on to college, I mostly forgot about my childhood ambitions. I majored in environmental science, got a job doing research at a university, and counted myself lucky that I did have work that I loved, even if it wasn't as exciting as I once dreamt it would be as a kid. And then a boyfriend introduced me to scuba, and my ambitions changed again. You'll love it, Maggie, he said, driving us to a nearby lake in landlocked Colorado. We had to make do with those. The sense of calm you experience under the water, it's nothing like you've ever felt before. Jeff was coming at it from the perspective of meditation and tranquility. He was a yoga instructor. But I was still excited to see things that most people hadn't, even if it was just a little patch of grass drifting back and forth on the bottom. Once I got into the water and felt myself sinking down, down, down beneath the surface, I was immediately hooked. To be sure, the regulator was a little tricky at first, and many of the basic skills were hard to master. How to switch regulators with your partner. How to clear your goggles of water. Every so often, I'd have a panic moment. Am I going to drown? Am I going to die down here? Before I got my wits about me, stayed calm and did like I was taught. Within a couple of months, I'd fallen out of love with Jeff. Sorry, dude. But I stayed in love with scuba. There was just something so captivating about it. Better than any TV show or movie you've ever watched. Sounds move through the water distorted like you're on an alien planet. A couple of hours underwater and it seems like you're the only person on the planet. That all life except for the fish flickering in and out of sight vanished. At the time, I found that amazing, which was how I found myself on a plane to Chuk Lagoon, Micronesia. In 10 years, I'd done a bunch of dives in the Caribbean, the Florida Keys, even an Arctic dive or two off the coast of Canada, but I wanted more. I wanted to see something that only the most dedicated would get to experience, only the people who were willing to push themselves. I'd seen pictures of Chuk Lagoon online, a lost world, coral climbing as high as buildings, schools of fish zipping around like cars in rush hour. There was something else I wanted to experience, too. During World War II, Chuk Lagoon had been used as a Japanese naval base. And in 1944, the United States attacked the lagoon during what was called Operation Hailstone. On February 17, 1944, five fleet carriers and four light carriers, along with support ships and some 500 aircraft, descended on the islands in a surprise attack. Just a week before the attack, the Japanese military had moved additional ships to the area, And as a result, approximately 250 Japanese aircraft were destroyed and more than 50 ships sunk. An estimated 400 Japanese soldiers were killed in one ship alone, trapped in the cargo hold. That's a lot of wreckage, just sitting at the bottom of the ocean now. And a lot of bodies were left in the wreckage. So in addition to seeing fish and coral, you'll probably see some skulls and skeletons. And maybe you'll find something new. I'd read online about how people had found tanks, bulldozers, motorcycles, boxes of ammunition, weapons, even cutlery and jewelry, everything forgotten by history. Some people were even convinced that they'd seen things that weren't so physical. After all, more than 3,000 people died in Operation Hailstone, and some posited that their final resting places being underwater meant their souls would never find eternal rest. The island's indigenous inhabitants, the Chukis, were decimated. Many had their homes razed by the Japanese or destroyed by U.S. bombs. They starved and died along with the Japanese, losing over a thousand people to a war they did not create and didn't want. And some say that a curse was placed on the wrecks, that anyone who went back for them would find their doom. 
but I wasn't super interested in all that. Give me doubloons, jewels, skulls, and wreckage any day. What did I need to see ghosts for? After a grueling journey from Honolulu to Guam to Chuuk International Airport, I collapsed in my hotel room, set an alarm for a half hour before I was supposed to meet up with my tour group, and fell asleep. Time now for the tale of the ghost fleet of Chuuk Lagoon. I awoke to the sound of my alarm blaring. And not only that, but I'd somehow managed to snooze it in my sleep, meaning I was now running about 10 minutes behind. Ah, there she is. The guide looked at me with what I could clearly see was mild annoyance, tempered by an outdoorsy, gung-ho personality. He was standing in the middle of the lobby with a small group, four people, standing around him. Yes, I'm here, sorry, I said, breathing heavily, as I just ran down the stairs from my room rather than take the elevator. You know how it is, time zones, jet lag. Yes, yes, I've heard, he said crisply. Maggie, is it? Oliver Stewart, I'll be your guide to the lagoon today. Though I wasn't thrilled about my entrance into the situation, I could admit to myself that Oliver looked like a good guide. 6'2", with fair hair and tan skin, he also looked every bit as strong as he would need to be to get five people ready for a day underwater and help if needed. This way, he instructed us, ushering the group to a van out front. I trust that everyone has their scuba certifications with them? We did. As we drove along a highway, or what passed for a highway out here, Bordered by thick tropical trees, we got to know each other. Jake and Marie Ann were from upstate New York in their mid-40s. Liliana was Italian and in her 60s, but looked strong as an ox. She had a body that was fitter than mine by a mile. And the last person was Oscar, a guy in his 50s with silver hair and a habit of mentioning his divorce a lot. Soon we were standing on a boat in the middle of a la- la lagoon, a spray of coiling tubes, wetsuits, wet b- weight belts, and oxygen tanks on the floor. All right. Oliver said, clapping his hands together. I don't have to go over the basics for this lot, do I? You're all advanced divers? Brilliant. Remember to stay in pairs, especially if you're heading into any wrecks. Most everything has stabilized in the past 80-odd years, but you never know. I quickly zipped up my suit, fastened my regulator, the breathing apparatus, and checked the gauges to make sure that everything was green. I noticed that Oscar seemed to be having a little trouble, and Oliver had to help him with some stuff I considered basic. Should I worry about him? was a thought that quickly floated into and then back out of my mind. Mostly, I was too excited to pay much attention. Already, the sea was so much more beautiful than anything I'd seen. Glittering, deep blue with fuzzy green ridges rising on three sides to an endless sky. Even just peering over the side of the boat, I could see glimmers of coral, pink, blue, red, like watercolor paints. I couldn't wait to get in. Turn you on, Maggie? Oliver offered, turning my safety valves. He shot me a grin. Have fun out there. With everything ready to go, I lined up with the others and slipped off the boat. The warmish water rushed up to meet me and I started to sink. Just remember, Oliver was speaking over the sound of splashing, but I couldn't make out the rest of what he said. I did hear, Maggie, did you get that? Maggie, just before sinking below the surface, rolling backwards into the deep blue. I figured that whatever it was, it must not have been that important. A flurry of bubbles passed in front of my vision for a second, and I took a moment to let my sense of balance catch up with me. Glancing around, I saw the others had already formed their own groups. Marie, Anne, and Jake, obviously, and Liliana and Oscar. That left me to choose who I'd third wheel with. Great. I chose Liliana and Oscar, who were swimming away from under the shadow of the boat on the bright white sea floor. After a few kicks downward, I joined them, flashing them an OK sign. They flashed one of their own, and as a group, we swam towards the reef. As we approached, we saw a beautiful world rise up in front of us. Coral of countless colors spread out beneath us, stretching away into the distance like we were jetliners flying over a city. Brightly colored fish swam about and in the coral, some darting quickly so they were just blurs of color, others moving slowly so you could see the sparkles in their eyes. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the long, slim, green body of a moray eel slide between two rocks, searching for its next meal. For about 15 or 20 minutes, we stayed in the area taking plenty of photographs and videos, the bubbles from our regulators steadily rising up to the surface. Then Liliana pointed a little further away from us towards where the reef dropped deeper into the water. The section of reef we were visiting rested on a shelf. Now it dropped a few hundred feet down over the edge. I nodded and followed her. As we moved into the deeper water, the animals changed. Fish became bigger, with a particularly curious trigger fish coming a little too close to comfort, causing me to shoo it away. I kept my eyes out for the darkened form of any sharks or barracudas. Both loved swimming over the reefs in search of sick or injured fish to pick off, and though attacks weren't at all common, it was still wise to be on the lookout. Just to reassure myself, I touched the knife at my waistband. 
It was supposed to be to cut yourself free if you got stuck on something, but it could have other uses too. When I got to the edge of where the shelf dropped off, I realized I hadn't seen Oscar in a minute. Where was he? For a moment, I couldn't locate him, and a small wave of trepidation coursed through me until I finally spotted him about 30 feet away. He looked like he was especially focused on something, though it was hard to tell under all the equipment. Might as well go see what he's looking at, I thought, and tapped Liliana on the shoulder before pointing. She nodded, and together we swam over to him. As we got closer, we still couldn't see what it was that he was looking at. It wasn't until Liliana tapped him on the shoulder that he pointed to the sand, and then we saw it. A coin. A big coin. I muffled an annoyed sigh, bubbles streaming out of my regulator. Any diver worth his or her shit knew that random coins weren't, well, uncommon. Certainly nothing to stare at in one of the most diverse and fascinating dive sites in the world. I couldn't see, beyond the algae growth on it, whether it was even a historic coin or just something somebody on a boat dropped like last week. As I watched, Oscar lowered to the ground to try to pick up the coin. But he couldn't. It was stuck somehow to the floor. He then reached into his waist pack and pulled out a pair of diving gloves. Slipping them on, he sank to the floor again, trying to pull the coin. After a few seconds, it seemed to give. A few seconds later, it came loose, a cloud of sand floating up to, the obs to obscure all of us. From the sand cloud, I thought I heard a shout. And then, ow! Something hit me in the leg. Oscar's regulator. It floated back down to the sand, kicking up another smaller cloud. I scrambled forward to catch it, offering it up to the writhing figure that was Oscar. For a moment, a rush of fear ran through me. Did Oscar know how to clear his regulator? That was basic, right? Before I saw Oscar regulator back on, holding his hand out as a thin stream of blood trickled from it. Shit, I thought. Shark migratory patterns meant they'd be out of this area, and the whole thing about a shark being able to smell blood instantly from a mile away was Hollywood fiction. Even if they did smell it, they wouldn't necessarily uh, want to eat us, but it still made me uneasy. Not too far away, dozens of gray tips and black tips were patrolling the edges of a place literally called Shark Island, but Oliver had reassured us we'd be safe. When I looked down, I couldn't even see what Oscar had cut his hand on. Everything looked smooth. Let's go up, I signed to Liliana. She shrugged, and I got what she meant. It wasn't like we were in danger. It was just weird. Keep going, she signed back, pointing at her watch. We only had another hour or so in this spot. Going back up with all the adjusting for pressure would eat up valuable time. Okay, Oscar agreed, wrapping the diving glove tightly around his cut hand. I'm fine. Let's keep going, he signaled. I reminded myself that I'd been in situations like this before, and nothing bad had ever happened. Liliana and Oscar were now uh, gesturing along the reef's edge, a long loop back to where the boat was, but interrupted by a foggy shape in the distance. Something huge, colossal, and moving along the seafloor? I blinked and grabbed my, my binoculars. No, it wasn't moving. The water just made it look that way. It wasn't even alive. It was a tank. As I looked through the binoculars, smiling, trying to fasten to memory, the first time I saw this amazing sight, all the air suddenly went out of my lungs. Through a jagged hole in the metal, a hand reached out from one of the holes, groping, feeling in the water, seeming to sense us as we swam past. It was pale and bizarre, looking impossible in this place far down beneath the waves. I almost screamed soundlessly, and then I looked again. It was just a flesh-colored starfish. But I had been so sure a moment before. Now I was pretty far behind the group, who had proceeded ahead without me. Thanks, guys, I thought, thinking about how I would never leave my group behind, but also that maybe, just maybe, I wanted to stay behind, or go back to the reef, the teeming small fish in bright colors where it was safe. Liliana and Oscar's forms became tiny, dim figures as they swam ahead, almost disappearing entirely. And then I had a burst of, well, something. All right, Maggie, cut the shit, a voice in my head said. You didn't fly for 24 hours to get left behind and miss out on seeing the exact wrecks you wanted to see when you planned this trip in the first place. Kicking hard with my flippers, I went as fast as I could, kicking up too much sand in the water but not caring. I was so excited to see my childhood dreams come true to get what I'd come for. I got to a few feet in front of the tank and breathed a sigh of relief. Even though I couldn't see Liliana and Oscar, I saw from the column of bubbles behind the tank that they'd just gone around the back. And then, something compelled me to peer over the edge of the reef. My eyes followed the drop down, down about a hundred feet, into a graveyard of ships. Their craggy, seaweed-covered surfaces loomed ominously, a never-ending stretch of wreckage. Some identifiable as planes, others simply cratered metal, stretching off into the distance until everything faded into murky darkness. I peered back at the tank, then had the idea to turn on my flashlight to get their attention, but nothing happened even as I kept waving it around. The bubbles moved slightly to the left, 
and I wonder if they found something fascinating or were simply trying to take a break, not wear themselves out. A tank was cool, but the graveyard over the edge was calling to me. I could see trails of bubbles there too. Maybe the others had gone down already? From my perspective above it all, the area held a strange beauty. It looked like something half living and half dead. As I descended, my breath started to catch in my chest. Jagged edges of metal gleamed in the dim light, and tangles of cables seemed to reach out like cold, dead fingers. It was terrifying, tragic, tremendous. I was feeling so many different emotions as I began to explore the awe-inspiring sight. Some of the planes had been reduced to skeletons of themselves. Propped up by decaying metal beams, a thick scum of barnacles grew over everything, like the ocean had claimed it all for itself. By the time my flippers brushed the sea floor, everything had risen up around me, impossibly tall, blotting out most of the weak light from the surface. I flipped on my flashlight again, wondered where to begin. I swam to the top of a ship's funnel, thickly encrusted with coral growth. I figured it would offer me a good vantage point to survey the hulk below. A hole on the hulk opened like a vast, dark cave, and out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw bubbles drifting up to, drifting up to the surface. Was something in there? Someone? Jake? Marie Anne? Slowly, I lowered myself down to the hole, and then I thought of something else. I'd seen that starfish, that starfish through my binoculars, the thing I'd thought was a hand but couldn't be, I told myself, absolutely couldn't be, but now that I was inside one of the wrecks, I noticed that there was absolutely no animal life to speak of. Usually with wrecks, fish and coral take over, happy to create new homes in the nooks and crannies. But inside these wrecks, it was almost completely barren, except for a thin scrum of coral and some seaweed. There was nothing else. Almost like the fish knew to stay away from it. But why? I could feel my heartbeat speeding up, even though I didn't feel, well, afraid. Almost like my body and my mind were on a delay. I took a deep breath, trying to calm down, and then noticed through a hole in the hole that there were still bubbles a few wrecks away floating up. That reassured me. Others from the dive were nearby. If anything happened, they'd be able to help. Reassured, I sank deeper into the massive underwater graveyard. The ship was tilted on its side, so the hole opened into a cavernous area. What would have probably been three floors had the wood not rotted out and made one continuous space. It was so massive that it was hard to see the floor, though I could make out a knot of pipes and equipment. Refuse piled on the ground like a junkyard. I could dimly make out a gas mask, which was terrifying and thrilling. The empty eyes peering out at nothing. A set of rotting stairs went down, 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 further into the gloom. The engine room and machine shop, I thought. I check it out and then head back up. As I descended, I got the sense of something swooshing back and forth in the water behind me. A shadow passing each time. But every time I turned to look, there was nothing there. A fish, I told myself, or many. Maybe they'd been feeding before and decided to come back home. Swoosh, swoosh. Always just out of my line of sight. As I descended, turning on my flashlight, I first saw a trio of engines, at least eight feet wide each, mounted on the wall. On the opposite wall were gauges, the glass crusted over with coral. But you could still see some, frozen in time, taking measurements at the exact moment they met their doom. Swoosh, swoosh. And then another sound surfaced, coming from deeper in the room. The unmistakable sound of an engine turning over and starting up. That was impossible, I thought. Everything down here had been waterlogged for almost a century. Nothing would be able to work after that. Maybe I was hearing a boat from up top? No, I decided as the sound grew in intensity. I was at least a hundred feet below the surface. Sound didn't carry like that. I swam forward, kicking up blackish dust that scattered through the room, and still as the engine sound grew louder, I heard it again, growing in intensity. Swoosh, swoosh. Swoosh, swoosh. A fish didn't swim like that. Now I was worried that something, a shark, was following me, even though I couldn't see it, because every time I turned around, whatever it was faded into the steep shadows cast by the rotting hole. I had no choice but to swim forward towards the engine sound, even though I knew that a shark didn't swim like that, didn't stalk its prey from the shadows. It burst out and grabbed what it wanted, knowing it was the apex predator. Whatever was following me was something else. I also knew that if I bumped into anything, dislodged anything, I could end up cutting myself badly or getting stuck somehow. Legs burning, I vaulted myself forward, trying my hardest not to touch anything. And that was when I felt something slide across my body, or multiple somethings. Was something grabbing at me through the water? When I reached the tiny room at the back, I turned around. Nothing was there. The swooshing had stopped. Even the humming, which had been so loud, roaring in my ears, had stopped. BAM! Something tightened around my throat, pulling me back until the he my head banged against the ship's side. A flurry of bubbles floated up. Too many bubbles, not just mine. Whatever had grabbed me was breathing. 
Now to the corner of my eye, I could see a group of ghostly hands <gasps> floating out to grab me, clutching my arms, faces flickering in and out of the dark. So many faces twisted in anger, their eyes black with desperation. A mass of ghosts, seemingly living ghosts, trapped residents of this doomed ghost fleet. As the hands tightened around my throat, the regulator got dislodged in the struggle. Still thrashing, I watched it float away, still tethered to my body, but just out of reach as I fought to move forward, but couldn't. For every hand I beat back, there was another one, ghostly white, reaching out for me. And there was a drumming on the ship's side, too, as though thousands of bodies were beating the hole, moaning and clamoring to get out, get out before they died. Suddenly, thankfully, I felt myself surge up. Not looking back, I swam and swam and swam, feeling my scuba suit rip a bit as I slid through a jagged hole and out of the ship. But I didn't care. I didn't have my regulator in. Had only a minute or two before I'd pass out. When I got up to the surface, I took a full, deep, gasping breath as though I'd been starved for air for years. My eyes burned with salt water, my entire body humming like a live wire. I bobbed in the water as the boat pulled up beside me, with only Oliver on it, or so I thought at first. All right, Maggie? He called, giving me a hand to pull me up. We were getting worried about you down there. We? I looked at him, frowning, dizzy in the sunlight. Where are the others? Then I saw them, all on the boat. They'd been on board for about 20 minutes. Oliver was just about to come looking for me. But what about the air bubbles? I'd seen coming out of the wrecks, I silently wondered. Bubbles that could have only belonged to them since there weren't any other diving boats out that day. Oliver was looking at me with concern. You all right, Maggie? Nitrogen? Kicking your ass a bit, perhaps? He was talking about nitrogen narcosis, a condition unique to diving. When it starts to kick in, people start doing strange things. They might seem like they're drunk or confused. It affects judgment, people become erratic, angry, paranoid, all sorts of emotions. I knew that if I said anything, it would be chalked up to that. Strange shapes moving around in the water, the sound of engines, bubbles streaming up to the surface where no living person should have been, a bunch of dead people grabbing me, trying to kill me. Nitrogen. It had to be. I spent the rest of the vacation on shore saying I'd risen up too quickly and wanted to moder monitor myself for the bends, which wasn't totally untrue, but also something... One thing in particular was making it hard for me to chalk up what had happened to nitrogen narcosis. At the end of the one day I dove, we were all piling back into the car, ready to be whisked back to the hotel where we could take long showers and drink cocktails by the beach. Understandably, everyone was pretty pooped. Everyone except Oscar. He looked like he was dealing with a lot more than fatigue. During the dive, I'd watched him cradling his hurt hand, the hand he'd mysteriously cut on something. Except now, the area around it was white and infected looking badly infected looking, like it was rotting, like he'd been under the water for ages, and his body, or at least his hand, had been disintegrating in the wreckage. Through Facebook, I heard that he died three months later, some mysterious illness eating away at his body until he became a corpse. I wondered, did the ghost fleet of Chook Lagoon claim another victim? And as I looked down at some little scratches on my leg I got when I swam out of the wreckage, scratches that still have not healed almost five months later, will it claim one more? My God. No, scuba diving. Ever. You don't want to be down inside a wreckage uh, hundreds of feet under the water? No, it sounds terrible. I know. I know. It's not for me either, I don't think. No. No, it's not. I mean, the... Cool for people who can do it. Well, that's the thing. Like, what you get to see and how beautiful yeah. I'm, I'm certain that it is. And yeah. I've watched enough, like, you know, videos and, you know, all oh, that's that. That's amazing. Yeah. But the thought of... Having to go down that deep, yeah, it's so dark. And I don't know, like I've seen a lot of creepy fish that only exist like deep dark down in. I just know myself. I would scream, like, yeah. I, I just am not a good emotional regulator. So I just <laughs> imagine myself with like all the scuba gear on. Like I scream. I like dislodge something. You know. Yeah, yeah. I get too panicked. I'm not a calm person. <laughs> So I don't think that it's for me. I, I know that there are people who are like, oh, no, you learn, you adjust. Uh -huh. Listen, Dan and I could barely snorkel, okay? Yeah. Would, like, it just, we're just not, I I have such a deep respect we were, we were for- We were not raised on the beach. No. Well, I, I spent a ton of time in water. It was not until my early 20s when I got my ass kicked in the ocean that mm -hmm. I was like, nope. And now I'm so scared of it. And that's all it takes. And, yeah. and also, I do have such a deep respect for the water. Like, it is so powerful, mm -hmm. but I don't have that respect, but then also want to, like, go out and challenge it yeah. or dive deep in it. Nope. I'm good up to my waist, and that's fine. My, my mom worked really hard to make me terrified of two things. I know what they are. Black eyes. And getting someone pregnant. Uh, I guess three things. <laughs> Black eyes, getting someone pregnant, and drowning. Drowning. Yeah, yeah. Stay away from, like, the river, but just, like, water in general, the ocean. Three and, things that could ruin your life. Three things that could ruin or end your life. Uh, <laughs> water. 
uh, getting the wrong person pregnant mm -hmm. and then, you know, spinning off the road in uh, black ice and dying in a wreck. Yep. Now, black ice, I'm not worried about. Uh, I feel like I, I'm in control when I'm driving. Um, I'm past the point now, obviously, like worried about like a pregnancy, uh, but water. <laughs> you should be worried about a pregnancy. If I get pregnant, we well, I'd have... be worried. It'd be a different problem then, <laughs> since I'm uh, not fertile. <laughs> since I'm sterile. Uh, but like, um, yeah, just uh, just drowning. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm fine. It's, it's it's so crazy. It's like a completely irrational thing. Yeah. But it's like when you just heard constantly in your childhood, every time somebody drowned that she knew or knew of from somebody else, anybody who drowned in like my area, and there was a lot actually who drowned in the Salmon River, I heard about every single death. And, and, and everyone that she made it sound like, oh, they were fine. Things were going great. You know, like they couldn't see it coming. And then there was this uh, undertow. Or, or whatever, you know, that sucked him down to the bottom and pinned him in the ocean. It was like, yep, a riptide is going to take you out and you're going to drown out at sea. Sneaker waves. Fucking sneaker waves I'm, are I'm, one of my worst nightmares. I, honestly. So like I, in a dream scenario where we have some like beachy vacation house, yeah. uh, I don't even need to be, and be able to enter the ocean. I just I need to be able to see it. Yeah. Just like look at it. Like, oh, look, I'll go swim in a pool. <laughs> <laughs> I know when we had that show in Hawaii recently, uh, outside our, on Waikiki, outside of our hotel, there was like this little, um, it was perfect little wall, like, uh, to, to kind of like stop the waves. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. There's a term for it, but I can't remember what it's called. Like a break wall, break, break wall, something like that. And it was no more than probably five foot deep on the beach side of the wall. That was perfect and, for us. <laughs> and that, so it's essentially the kiddie pool of yes, the ocean. Yes. No, it was and so great. Yeah. You and I were, and grandparents and their grandkids were like the only people hanging out there. It was, I don't it was care. fine. I don't care. Uh, meanwhile, our friends went scuba di or uh, snorkeling with sharks, and uh, they were like, "Do you want to go?" I'm like, "Are you nope. insane?" And I just kept teasing them. I'm like, "This is your last dinner we're having together. You're gonna yeah. die." <laughs> I'm like, mm, mm -mm. okay, I have some pics. These are really cool pictures. This first one is a pic of some of the ghost fleet wreckage, and uh, then a diver exploring it. I mean, it it's is incredible, and I'm I'm so glad that some people get to experience that. Yeah. Uh, this next one. This is a picture taken inside one of these sunken ships. Wow. Crazy, some old apparatus for who? It looks like it might be like uh, the captain's area of the boat. Like maybe that's where they were steering it. I don't know. Um, this next one, a picture of a skull, some bones, and some old gear down there in the wreckage. And there's all kinds of photos like this. I mean, there's a lot of people still down there. Yeah, I mean that is what did you like thousands, right? Did you say thousands died? And I don't know how many of the bodies were recovered. Man, I think most were left. Um, uh, finally, another picture of the many human skulls found around the wreckage. Wow. Yeah. Aye, aye, aye. Oh, see, this would be me. I'd be down there and just like some shift and then like one of those little skeletons would move and I would lose my ever loving mind. Like aye, it would just, aye. I don't know. I don't know how you stop breathing down there, but I would <laughs> stop breathing. Uh, yeah. Nope. Never doing it. Uh, this story actually did take me back to when we were in Honolulu. We went to the Pearl Harbor Museum, uh -huh. and then we went to the USS Arizona Memorial. Yeah. And I was just thinking about all of, you know, the people that are still under there. And they yeah. do this incredible thing uh, where if you were a member of that fleet who survived that uh, tragedy, when you died, your urn could be returned to the ship. So they would, divers would take you down and inter you. And there's only, our friend was telling us, there's only one still living still member living yeah. from that and his family has decided not to inter him there for yeah. you know whatever reasons but so that's it like it's claimed all of its all of its people and it was like it yeah. just thinking about it just being there i mean even just talking about it my eyes are watery but it's it's heavy it's very 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 heavy a lot of a lot of young people yeah 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 uh okay are you ready to move on from a graveyard in the sea to a haunted house in ohio uh yeah that sounds like a good switch Okay, not much set up for this story. We're just going to jump right in. Let's go. Time now for the tale of the Belair House. Belair, Ohio. A few thousand people living just outside of and across the Ohio River from Wheeling, West Virginia. And just a few more miles from the Pennsylvania state line. And the town is home to a house that claims to be one of America's most haunted. The Belair House was supposedly built on land with all kinds of history that may feed directly into current claims of paranormal activity. For starters, it's said to sit directly atop both a ley line and a Shawnee burial ground. Ley lines, it's been a minute since I mentioned them, are straight lines that connect notable historic structures, prehistoric sites, and prominent landmarks. 
Ley line adherents assert that ancient societies recognized these alignments and deliberately built structures along them due to a variety of its uh, or of supernatural reasons. Sitting on 1699 Belmont Street, built in 1847, the home was originally inhabited by Jacob Hetherington, who owned a coal mine that ran directly beneath the house. It was once known as Mine Number no. One. And 42 men once died in Mine Number no. One after an explosion in 1893. It took weeks to recover all the bodies. Not long after the explosion, Jacob's son Alex, helping his father run the mine before his father passed away, started hearing and seeing things that were not there. Or at least he started to see and hear things no one else could see or hear. Things that he very much believed were there. The ghosts of men who died in the mine. He began to have seizures and started declaring that, quote, demons were trying to kill him. He ended up being locked away in the Athens Asylum for the Insane in Athens, Ohio. He would die in that asylum years later. Some locals thought that the house drove him mad, or something haunting the house did. After he was sent away, Alex's daughter Lydia tried to run her grandfather's company. She died a few years later, mysteriously inside the home. She'd seemed perfectly healthy, and then her still lifeless body was found in a room of the house one morning that is now called the seance room. Her brother, Edwin, had moved into the home with his sister just a year or so earlier, and he was devastated by her death. Heartbroken, he became obsessed with the idea of an afterlife. He set himself out on a mission to contact his sister. What had happened to her? How? Why did she die? Where was she now? He looked to spiritualism, popular at the time in the area, and he tried everything from having mediums attempt to channel his sister's spirit to the use of spirit boards, a.k.a. Ouija boards, to contact her himself. He also hosted numerous seances in what is now called the seance room to contact Lydia. Many believe that the combination of Edwin's openness, or many do believe that the combination of Edwin's openness to spirits and numerous attempts to contact the spirit world, as well as the location of the house being on a natural ley line above a mine tragedy and near native burial grounds, created the perfect storm and catalyst for an especially intense haunting. Since the early 1900s, the house has built up a sinister reputation, with owners, neighbors, and visitors all reporting various encounters. People have claimed for decades that they felt watched, seen shadowy entities and lifelike figures moving about, witnessed items moving around on their own, and more. Current owner, Kristen Lee, thought she got the deal of a lifetime when she bought the house in 2005 for just $26,000. Oh my God. She has since tried to sell it numerous times, and been unable to unload it. It was last listed for $69,000 in 2011, no takers. Kristen bought the house after she and her family tragically lost their previous home to a hurricane. Not long after moving in, the Lees began being plagued by bad luck, a continual feeling of being watched, dark, depressive episodes, and even physical violence. Kristen claims that the family dog, Bella, was once thrown against the wall by an unseen force, and that one night as she sat on the couch watching TV, she felt and then saw the figure of a strange man standing behind her. Startled after yelling out, she started to ask the man who he was, why he was in her home. He turned away, started to walk away, and just faded to black. She'll call him the Gray Man, and she and others will claim to have seen several, uh, had several more encounters with the Gray Man. Kristen has also claimed that she and others have witnessed spirits believed to be the ghosts of former residents Edwin and Lydia. She's also supposedly encountered the spirit of a child that died in the home, Emily Davis, or perhaps a malevolent entity pretending to be Emily's ghost. One day, not long after first hearing the sound of a little girl's voice in her home, Kristen said she found her young son and some of his friends who'd come over to play some video games out on the roof of the home. They'd crawled out of her son's window. When confronted with why they'd crawled out onto the roof, the children all said that they'd seen a little girl in a white dress playing on the roof who had asked them to join them. When they crawled out, she walked over the roof's peak and disappeared. Kristen worried that the ghost, or whatever kind of entity it is, was trying to lure the kids into a tragic accident, and decided it was time, as you have said here so many times before, Lulu, to get the fuck out. Yep. After failing to sell the home, Kristen attempted to rent the property out to other families, but they never lasted more than a few months, complaining about their own frightening encounters. Supposedly, one family, after moving into the Belair, Belair house, lost six different family members. Jeez. Some living in the home and some not to supposed natural causes. They were out after that. Unable to sell or rent the home, Kristen attempted uh, to set the house up for the public and began allowing teams of paranormal investigators to explore it. 
Since, there have been several reports and stories of strange accidents, intense, crippling feelings of dread, and physical assaults, such as reports of visitors feeling a tug, or a push, or even being tripped. Investigators have claimed seeing a shadowy figure walking about in the empty rooms, and more feelings of being watched, especially when investigators work alone overnight. Unexplained footsteps have been heard creaking up and down the stairs. Phantom voices have been heard emanating from the walls, as if someone was trapped inside the walls, and doors and cabinets have both been heard and witnessed opening and closing on their own. Want to see if all these allegations are nonsense? Nothing more than Kristen marketing a home she can't sell or rent to make some money another way? Or find out if this home is truly haunted? You can head to BelairHouseTours.com and rent the entire house at 1699 Belmont Street in Belair right now for an overnight stay or for multiple nights if you're feeling especially brave. No thanks. You want to stay there? Ah, uh, chic show. It is a pretty creepy looking house. Like it's just like a classic looking kind of horror house. And Bel Air, not Bel Air. You know, when I looked up, uh, I, I've been it was going me and say. I know when I when I go to uh, for pronunciations now of like local places. Yeah, my go to is local news. A- absolutely. Yep, I put in the name of the place. Uh, That's a, a hint for anybody looking for a way to pronounce things. I trust newscasters because they're not going to have that heavy regional accent. Yeah. Uh, and you just put like you know whatever town plus news. Yeah. And that's how the news person said it was Bel Air. Okay. Well, thank like, you. Yeah, emphasis on the second part because I was going to say it like California, the Prince of Bel Air. Yeah. I don't okay. know. Yeah. Well, I guess it's, is it spelled? It's spelled B E L L A I R E. Okay. Okay. Well, as opposed to the B E L capital A. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Belair. Belair. I just never heard of it. And then in my mind, I was like, is he, is he mush mouthing over there? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, yeah, I'm trusting whatever, I trust it whatever too. news anchor I saw. Agreed. May I see the photos? <laughs> yeah. Uh, this first one is an exterior picture of the infamous Belair house. Oh, yeah. I mean, come on. You can just Classic. think about what that's going to look like at night. Yep. Uh, This next one, a spooky little pic of the attic from somebody who uh, chose to stay there for the night. And that's like with some daylight, you know, that's Uh, only getting worse. Uh Uh-huh. This next one, I mean, they've leaned into it for sure. The the Kristen here. Fun little collection of dolls in one of the home's bedrooms. (laughs) A little doll house. I mean, they're they're trying to make it spooky with that. Well, yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. True. If that's what the house is, is, draws. Uh, This next one, a collage of Kristen, her dog, Bella. And some shots taken inside and outside the house. And then finally, the classic creepy night uh, time shot of the house. Ooh. Yep. I mean, up on a little hill even with the woods behind it. I mean, that mm. is like, uh, I'm surprised a film crew hasn't rented it out. Oh, yeah. To use for a horror movie. Yeah. Since it's already set up for that. Kristen, if you're listening, you just need to reach out to some Hollywood execs. Oh, man. Oh, man. Get on the... Just listen, you just want to get in touch with the Teamsters that do location scouts, <laughs> and uh, off you go. I mean, if it's not haunted, and this is marketing, I will say she's doing a good job. She's a genius. Because I looked into the availability of the next few months, just out of curiosity. Yeah. And I would say like two weekends a month mm-hmm. on average is rented out. Okay. And I and to rent out the whole house, you can have you know variety of people stay there with you. Oh, yeah. For uh, the weekend. I want to say, I am just remembering, I don't have this written down, but I think it's right at about a thousand bucks. Dang. So if you're getting like, you know, 2000 bucks uh, a, month? a month for a house that you spent less than 30,000 buying. Yeah. Those are pretty good numbers. Those are pretty good numbers. You know, mm-hmm. you got electric bills and taxes and yeah. all that, but like, you're making a profit. Yeah. You're doing all right. Yeah. I would imagine one weekend covers all the expenses of the house. Yeah. And then anything else is profit. Okay. Well, good for you. Yeah. Uh, there was no mention of having the house like blessed or bringing in any any energy healers. So yeah, at this it, point, it could too, have happened, but maybe I didn't see that either. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I also feel like, well, you know, I mean, if you're going to lean into the haunted house angle, you can't have it blessed now. Yeah, Kristen did write a book that's on Amazon with you know more details. Okay. Um, well, yeah. I mean, making the most out of a situation it sounds like she didn't know what yeah. she was getting into, and then it's like, all right, well, what can I do to, you know, navigate this now? Totally. Well, good for her. She sounds for uh, her. like a problem solver. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Uh, so you got your little Layla's over there? I got, I got a little Valentine's Day little devil guy. A little love devil? Layla's, and then a little pink Layla. Mm-hmm. And, and a red Layla. And a red one. But yeah, oh, I'll, I'll look hold at these it. two. And are you going to talk about the scholarship? Yeah, I am. Okay, just checking. Yeah, thank, thanks for asking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you're funny. I wasn't ready to talk about it. Oh, okay. I was going to talk about how I'm, I went like OG with the blanket that has mm-hmm. like little Dan and little Lindsay on it. We have this. Cute. We have a little love nugget. Do you remember when I got these chicken nuggets? 
from uh, fans in Missoula. They saw me on the side oh, of the road yes. and chased me down. I mean, that's they right. didn't see me on the side of the road. They saw me parking we were, my car. Yeah, we were downtown. That's right. That yeah. was fun. That was awesome. Yeah. And then uh, and then this is really cool. Some fans sent this in, yeah. uh, Don't Be a Darren, and they get the fuck out with a really cool design and frame. That's awesome. Yeah, actually, on the back, it says, um, Okie Dokie Decor at Okie Dokie Decor on Instagram. Like O-K-E-E-D-O-K-E-E. -E well, thank you, Okie Dokie, because like, oh, that is amazing. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. Thanks to everybody who sends stuff in. I know, like, we just, you know, for the average listener, don't want to, like, you, you know, like, for people who are like, okay, okay, you got this, exactly, yeah. you know. But, like, we are very thankful, and it's just, it's crazy that people still send stuff in. And Tyler was in charge of the mail, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, we got Haven't even checked the mail since he left. Oh, shoot, we gotta, yeah. yeah, so we're figuring out <laughs> some new systems of things. I was like, oh, shoot, I forgot that he did that. <laughs> uh, okay, yep, and then just a reminder before I dive into my stories that round two of the Cummins Family Scholarship Fund presented by Bad Magic is here, kind of. As you're listening to this, uh, you still have a little bit of time before it opens. Uh, it opens on March 6th, and applications are due by April 24th, and there are four $5,000 scholarships, and uh, it's open to everybody, even if you won last year, or I shouldn't say won, even if you were awarded a scholarship last year, you're welcome to reapply because it's not a renewing scholarship. And we didn't do renewing scholarships simply because we don't know how long we're going to have the funds to be able to do this. So we didn't want to make any sort of commitments to anybody uh, that we were uncertain about keeping. So thanks to our patrons who uh, help us make this happen every year now. And if you want more information, just go to badmagicproductions.com and there is a scholarship banner and it will link you out to where you need to go and all the info is there. So hop on over there and get it done. Perfect. Okay. Now, are you ready to be scared? I am. Okay. Let's go to this. Uh, this is a, a lighter uh, haunted house, but I just love that everybody in the family was like, yep, that happened. Okay. Hey, Dan. Hey, Lindsay. Creeps Hello. and peepers. This is the story of the house I grew up in and of the paranormal entities that we shared with that home. Time now for the tale of <laughs> the family ghosts of the 401 house. Abilene, Kansas, 1904. In a white in a white, two-story corner house with the number 401 pinned on the doorframe, an elderly dentist named Dr. Worley ran his practice out of the front room of the first floor. He lived there with his homemaker wife, who would mostly keep to herself in the kitchen of the upstairs mother-in-law suite and out of the path of the patients. The loving couple would stay in that house together, even beyond death. Fast forward a few decades to when my mother had me. My parents' landlord did not want to live next door to a screaming infant, and therefore, my family returned from the hospital to find an eviction notice taped to the door. My parents had already been towing the line of this man's patients with my mom's other two children, ages four and five, and a third, even younger one, was his last straw. Not sure what else to do, my mother called her father and told him about the tight spot she found herself in. My grandpa did not hesitate to offer help. He was in the process of finalizing paperwork on a house he had bought from a foreclosure auction. It was in her hometown, just 25 miles away. The house was old and in desperate need of repairs, but during this time of hardship, it might as well have been a mansion. There were three bedrooms on the first floor, one in the upstairs mother-in-law suite, and a full attic on the second floor used for storage. After a few years, my family would move out and another aunt or uncle would find themselves needing a place to live with their kids for a while. For the longest time, this house would home one branch or another of my extended family. My own family would live there a total of four separate times. It was no secret in the family about the character and personality that the house exhibited. You know, a polite way of saying the haunted that the house was haunted as fuck. It took over a decade of comparing stories between family members for everyone to have a clear picture of who was haunting the halls of the 401 house, how many of them there were, and what they each specifically did that was unique to them. The first entity that quickly made itself known was the ghost of a teenager that we would call the Drifter. Eventually, this particular ghost would respond to the name Elliot. Elliot was the kind of ghost that liked to be acknowledged regularly and would retaliate to, uh, to people when they ignored him by moving items. One time, my mom was looking for her name work tag that was always left on the fridge as it had a magnet on the back, but it was missing. Running late and finally coming to terms with what had happened, she left the kitchen, asked Elliot to give her name tag back, and came back into the kitchen to see it right in the middle of the fridge. Another special thing that we eventually learned about Elliot was that only certain people could see him, homosexual men. 
More on that later. (laughs) The next ghost that everyone in the family realized was in the house was that of a little girl, somewhere around the age of four or five. After many little girls in our family, myself included, began to have an imaginary friend named Rosie while living in the house, it became clear that Rosie wasn't just in the minds of all these young kids. Aside from playing with the little girls living in the house, Rosie was known to run out of the peripheral of parents' vision or climb into bed with them on the occasion that she got scared. Thunderstorms were a certain guarantee of feeling an invisible force with tiny hands curl up next to you. She was an otherwise sweet girl that kept to herself. And then finally, the dentist and his wife. These two really only made a presence of themselves when they were unsatisfied with someone's behavior in the house and felt that a bit of course correction was called for. (laughs) My typical interactions with the dentist would be old radios in the storage attic suddenly turning on and blaring ragtime music despite not being plugged in and having no alternative power source. The dentist's wife would be heard in the upstairs kitchenette late at night, rummaging around, clanging pots and pans that oftentimes weren't even in there. When my brother had just graduated high school and wasn't really thinking of going to college, he moved into the upstairs apartment, what we had taken to calling the mother-in-law suite, as he began working on becoming independent. His lack of motivation at the time led to him playing loads of video games all day, eating nothing but takeout, and drinking strictly Monster or Mountain Dew. This ended when he heard an old man stomp up the stairs that led to the apartment, slam the apartment door open while shouting, is he up yet? This sent my brother racing downstairs, face sheet white, panicking, asking if our grandpa was in town, which he was not. While each ghost had its own particular set of stories, there is one particular story that our family absolutely loves about the one time all four ghosts worked together to chase out an unwelcome resident. This story takes place during the third time my family took our turn living in the house. My mom was married to my now ex-stepdad, my sister had married and moved out, and my mother had decided to rent out the upstairs apartment to a couple that had been family friends in the town that we had just moved from. We did not know at the time we helped them move in that these two would be nightmare roommates. Vicky and Steve would never clean up the apartment. They repeatedly came down and ate our food without asking, and they had an annoying little dog that never stopped barking. They would be loud late into the night and always had trouble paying rent on time. My mom was complaining about them, trying to figure out the best way to get rid of them, when my then stepdad, Murdoch, joked that she should just sick the ghosts on them. That it wasn't that Murdoch never believed in the ghosts, it's just that he had his doubts about these particular ghosts, as he never actually saw any real proof of them. My mother decided this was a pretty good idea, and asked out loud to the empty room for the ghosts to, quote, do your worst, do your best, just get these people out of here. And in the end, it only took one week. I guess it was kind of cruel, but we never did get around to telling Vicky or Steve about the ghosts in the house. They were very adamant non-believers of the supernatural, and it just wasn't an argument worth having. So these very logical thinkers began having to find scientific and realistic reasons why they kept waking up to some invisible child crawling into bed with them. And we would just shrug and let them make their own theories. Aside from Rosie crawling into bed with them, radios would now turn themselves on every night a few times. There were sounds of someone very loudly cooking in the kitchen as well. Those sounds would go mute as soon as either of them ran to check what was happening. Their things were not only going missing, but would reappear in completely different rooms altogether in insane places that no one would ever place anything intentionally. The two were also a bit panicked because they had turned the apartment upside down while packing and still could not find the keys to their very own truck. That was until Vicky was pulling the drawers out of the dresser completely and dumping the contents into black trash bags that she heard a loud clunk. The keys were inside of the dresser itself, in between the drawers. At one point during the move out, Steve's brother took a nap on a recliner only to wake up to a teenage boy smiling down at him, winking before disappearing completely when the man blinked. When he asked my mom about it, my mom politely asked him if he happened to be gay. He confirmed that he was out and proud, and she left (laughs) it at that with no further explanation. At the end of the day, the three of them were nothing more than dust in the wind, and Murdoch finally acknowledged the family ghosts of the 401 house. 
To this day, the 401 house is still in my family and my mom has since bought the house for my grandpa. My brother passed away back in 2015 and we buried his ashes in the front yard of that home. The old lady that has been renting the house for my mom has reported that her TV will occasionally turn itself on and off throughout the day. We like to think that this new phenomenon is due to the television junkie my brother was adding his own bit to the haunting of our childhood home. Thankfully, this tenant is not skittish around the supernatural and has simply learned how to coexist with the house ghosts the same way we did. As far as scary ghost incidents, 401 gave us an opportunity to be on the fun side of a haunting. It had honestly felt more like living in a Halloween attraction than anything terrifying. Sincerely, Kay. Please give a shout out to Spencer Melaus. Uh, he's a big <laughs> fan, and I know he would love it. Oh, thanks, Kay, and thanks, Spencer. Yeah, it's a fun. One. Yeah, yeah, I like. I like. I mean, there was a lot going on there. Yeah, that could have easily scared the shit out of. Like, it could have been a very dark perspective on all of that. Yeah. Uh, interesting that they were just like, yeah, whatever. Like, we're not being hurt. Yeah, like, nothing like was seemed to be out to scare them. Mm-hmm. Just a little. One little ghost wanted some comfort, I guess. And then, I know that like, is the creepiest of them, by yeah, the way. Like little I hands. Ha- I couldn't like, handle that one. Yeah. Yeah. A lot Something of those. Something crawling into bed with you. Uh, one, just one of the little details that would have scared me is um, when they he talked about the or somebody in the story. Uh, I, I don't know why I said he. I don't remember if it was he she. But talked about the the radio playing ragtime music uh-huh. turned on. That would freak me out because there is not a station in the country that I, that I know of right. that plays ragtime music anymore. I don't even know if there's a Sirius XM channel that plays it. Like, I don't, I, I think you'd yeah. really have to like curate a Spotify playlist for that. Yeah, it's a pretty, obs- it's not a super popular genre. Right. <laughs> like, like anymore. Yeah. yeah so, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, that alone would be freaky because I'm like, that's not coming from a real station. Right. That's coming from some other World. Universe, yeah. yeah, yeah, and then and then just the numerous ghosts like working together. I loved that. It reminded me of Beetlejuice. Oh yes, like the situation where there's like multiple entities in the house that like are aware of each other and can interact with each other. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I just thought it was so funny this idea that you could like be living in a haunted house where they don't really bother you. They're playful, but mm-hmm. maybe not scary. And then you can summon them all to get together and do some teamwork. <laughs> right, right. So like in my mind, I was like, man, if you had like a family member that you didn't mm-hmm. like oh, and man. you and you knew you could essentially rally the troops and then, you know, this like shitty aunt is coming yeah. over who's like moody or whatever. And then you're like, okay, ghosts, do your thing. That'd be amazing if you had like friendly ghosts in your house that you could kind of, you yeah, kind of like became friends with. My God. Like you could ask them ah. questions. They could tell you about the, I mean, how comforting that could possibly be. Tell you about the afterlife. And then if you could actually like, um yeah, like you said, like direct them to antagonize other people that Can are you like imagine? You know, being jerks or whatever. Uh, that, that'd be a pretty magical existence. That'd be, that's like the best case scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're just hoping that this, you know, these few happy ghosts uh-huh. uh, are actually who they are. Are, are presenting themselves to be and that you're not also like dealing with a naughty entity. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. But I thought that was fun. That was Just fun. A little, a little switch. And then now we'll get back into a more traditional scary sighting. Okay. Did you have anything else? I'm sorry. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Hey, Dan and Lindsay. My name is Kat and I'm from the... Kat. <laughs> I'm from the Green Mountains of Vermont. My story takes place on an old dirt road only one minute down from where I currently live. So yes, I'm constantly reminded of this insane encounter every time I leave my house. The road is only about two miles long and offers snowmobile trails, swimming holes, and is a popular spot for people to go drink, party, and have bonfires. It's a frequented spot amongst locals and has been for decades. I've been hanging out there since I was an early teen, so I am very familiar with the area and had never felt anything strange until this encounter. I'd always heard tales of ghosts, UFOs, and Bigfoot, especially since I live in the Bennington Triangle, but I never saw anything before this. It all started when I was up to no good. I was 16 and thought I was invincible. So naturally, when my mom said no to me hanging out with my boyfriend that night, I just snuck out instead. We drove my beat-up Chevy Blazer down the road and pulled off to the side to smoke the devil's lettuce. (laughs) We parked so that we were still parallel to the road, and thanks to the full moon, we had a clear sight line in front and behind us. My boyfriend, Jake, got out of the car with me and walked to the front of the car. We leaned on the hood, chatting, while Jake rolled us a joint. Once he was done, I bent back into the driver's side to grab a lighter when we both heard a guttural, blood-curdling scream echo through the trees. 
Jake and I froze, looking at each other, waiting for the other to laugh it off or come up with some sort of explanation. Before we could speak, we heard the scream again, only it was closer this time. I was about to ask Jake what he thought it was when Jake yelled at me to get into the car. We both got in and locked the doors. Jake immediately wanted to haul ass out of there, but I'm not one to immediately choose flight. I wanted to stay and see who or what was making that sound. I anxiously started asking questions while fumbling for my keys, and as soon as the ignition turned, I let out a shriek. My headlights illuminated the figure of a woman standing in front of my car just 20 feet away. Her skin was bruised and pale. Her brown, tattered dress hung around her ankles, and her bony finger stuck out, pointing at us. Her mouth fell open like she was screaming, but we could no longer hear a single sound. Her body was slightly crooked, making her lean to one side rather dramatically. The most disturbing detail was her forehead. It had small, bloody, jagged deer antlers sticking out in all different directions all around her head. Yeah. I felt sick to my stomach and could barely hear Jake screaming for me to put the car in reverse and get us the hell away from her. I threw the car into gear and before I could slam my foot on the gas, she was gone. She completely vanished from sight, even though not a second before she had been standing just in front of us. It took a moment for us to recuperate, but once we did, I dropped Jake off and snuck back into my house for a sleepless night. Like I said before, there was clear sight all around us. The force can be thick, but being on the road with a bright moon, we had good visibility and we would have seen someone else approaching or leaving. It would have made me feel better to know that we had smoked the joint before all of this happened, but we hadn't even lit it, so it wasn't like drugs were involved. Not that I've ever known anyone to have a full-on hallucination under the influence of THC, but, you know, just eliminating any possible explanations. Jake and I agreed to not speak of this to anyone. It's a small town, and we didn't want people to think we were spreading crazy rumors or shared some kind of temporary psychosis. I tried not to think about it much and never mentioned it to my parents because, well, then I'd have to explain sneaking out. About five years after, when I was hanging out with my mom and stepdad, we were sharing stories when we got onto the topic of the paranormal. I finally shared my story with them now that I couldn't receive consequences. And at the <laughs> end of it, my stepdad said, oh, wow, I haven't thought about her in forever. You saw a dear lady. I sat there <laughs> gobsmacked as he proceeded to tell me that in high school, 20 years ago, what? two of his friends were leaving a party when they also stopped on the side of the road to smoke, exactly as what had happened to us. They saw Dear Lady suddenly appear in front of their vehicle and shared the same details that I did. My stepdad thought they were full of shit or smoked some really bad weed. For months, their friends ragged on them, giving them shit for being too stoned, but that uh, but that all came to a head when my stepdad and three other friends were driving in the same area and saw Dear Lady standing in the middle of the road as they rounded a corner. He described her the same as I did and said it was the most disturbing thing they had ever seen. They slowed the vehicle to a crawl and drove around her, completely shocked that the other friends hadn't been lying. I never would have shared my story, but hearing my stepdad and five of his other friends corroborate my experience completely flipped my reality. There really is so much we don't know. If a freaking scary deer lady with bloody oh antlers God. coming out of her head exists in the middle of bumfuck nowhere Vermont, just imagine what else is lurking throughout the globe. Cat. Thank you, Cat. I, I was picturing like, I guess with the time frame, it would have to be like, you know, two, maybe like a... Uh, mother and then daughter. like like there's just these weird creepy people out in the woods <laughs> who this is like the joke they've just been playing just fucking with people for decades now this oh, elaborate like, it's deer it's like a antler. family tradition yeah costume and then you just go out to the makeout spot and then you just pop out in front of people's like cars <gasps> that's almost scarier in a way okay that's actually really funny just yeah. thinking about like where we live too I mean we uh -huh. would cause car accidents probably but like it'd be really fun <laughs> to start a family tradition of like okay once a month if there's a Friday the 13th yeah. we just like kind of hang out by like the edge of our fence yeah and then when we see like a car kind of driving just a little bit slow yeah. we just <laughs> it's been forever since i've talked about it uh here maybe i talked about it a time sake. it's been so long i don't remember but uh some friends i had in college they were from issaquah washington which is on just by seattle but it's like just over snoqualmie pass heavily forested by the freeway there and in high school, they bought a gorilla suit, like oh a my nice. God, <laughs> nice... I don't think you've ever talked about this here, okay. or I'm not remembering. Nice looking gorilla suit, and then they would just drive up on the little like service road up to like near the top of the pass, 
And it's pretty, other than the freeway I-90, it's, you know, it's pretty dark. <laughs> and Steve, uh, or no, Sean, doesn't matter if it's dark, but the Sean, the Sean, Ho- Sean Hoffman, I don't know if he's, if you're listening. He, Sean's a huge fan. <laughs> he would sprint across the road. Oh my God. In the gorilla suit, like, you know, just ahead of cars enough where they're like, he would look like a Sasquatch, you know, that's yeah. where they're supposed to be Sasquatches in this area. And I just wonder like how many people to this day are, conv- I would love it. Now, now it's like the, if it, it would have to happen before now, but I would have loved it if before now somebody would have sent in a story, be like, "Hey, in the uh, in the mid '90s <laughs> or late '90s." I want an email now of like, "Oh my god, that <laughs> motherfucker!" He got me. Yeah, yeah. Oh god, that'd be so great. And then, um, oh, and then I just had another weird thought with that, where it's like her stepdad and his friends like were smoking weed. She was smoking weed. I was like, well, maybe there's just a specific strain of weed. <laughs> you can only get in Vermont? Only comes, yeah, grows in Vermont that has like this very uber specific hallucinogenic property of like, if you get high enough, you see Dear Lady. <laughs> sure. <laughs> also, I just wanted to um, give you a correction. Yeah. You're not holding your Layla's correctly. Not, oh, 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 this one couldn't breathe. Oh, yes, from finishing school. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's interesting that yeah, I'm in finishing school right now, so I'm oh, really uh, sensitive, <laughs> yeah, to the details of it. So funny, like just from not doing that, that like I, my pinkies would wear out if I did that for very Can long. Can I hold one for a second to see how it feels? Yeah. Yeah, just like my pinkies not used to doing that. It feels like almost like tense there at the joint. Like, mm, this isn't what we do. I don't have that feeling. Oh. Next, okay, if I remember next week, I'll hold a Layla and see if I can hold <laughs> it like this long? the entirety of your story. <laughs> Perfect. She, she is warm and toasty. You have yeah, warm you wanna, hands. You want to hold on to her? Yeah, she's all, she's softened up because mm-hmm. you have warm hands. her. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> those are great stories. Thank you. Yeah. I loved both of those. It was Kat, and was it Kat and K? It was. Double, double K today? Oh, uh, one's with a C, one's with a K. Oh, cat with a C. Yeah. Oh, okay. Like, I guess Ka- Catherine. Catherine can be spelled either way. I think. I mean, yeah. I don't. I don't know if cat mm-hmm. is Catherine. Mm-hmm. I. Uh, I don't know if I could even. I would love that. it if cat if she goes by cat and cat is short for kitty cat. Like her <laughs> birth legal name is actually kitty cat. Uh, uh, <laughs> terrible parents you have. Oh my god! Wait, what was? What did we just watch? American Nightmare. Ooh. Matt Mustard. Oh yeah, Detective Mustard, who was also a dick. A dick. Yeah. Hope you're listening. Uh. Yeah. You're you're a rude asshole. Um, yeah. But I was like, really? Your last name is Mustard, and you guys thought it was a good idea to just name him Matt Mustard? <laughs> that is so fucking rude. Yeah, Matt, Mr. Matt Mustard. Colonel Mustard. <laughs> you should have just named him Colonel, honestly. Oh my God. That would have been better. Your last name is Mustard, you name your son Colonel? Colonel Mustard? That is a sick joke. <laughs> that is. I would just love to play, like, you don't actually call your, that's not actually your child's birth name, but once they, like, figure out you play Clue with Clue, them. Yeah, and then the nickname becomes Colonel? No, and then you just like, you're like, well, listen, you know how your middle name is just the letter C? Like, like yeah. it, would, it would be a long, long play. It would be pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, do you want to do some shout outs? Yeah. Do you want me to start or do you want to start? Oh, you could go first. Okay. I would like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting our show. Ryan Roberts, Maine on fire. <laughs> I like it. Well, uh, like a hair mane, uh-huh, right? M-A-N-E, yeah. Karen McCool, Roxanne Conniff, Kaylee LaRose or LaRose, Jenny Campbell, uh, Romanatrix. That's a funny one too. Just a Pigeon Nest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sean and Ghost and Somos. Uh, just a Pigeon Nest makes me think of somebody that we uh, have like a working relationship with and he has a bunny and the bunny's name is oh, Pigeon. Yeah. True. And, and I was just thinking <laughs> about Pigeon's Nest. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to thank the following Annabelle's as well. Jesse, Katie Curtin, Michelle Esparza, Kimberly Gooseman, Megan, I, th- I think it's Megan because it's M-A-E, Megan Jackson, Rachel Conroy, Sarah Winter, Tuka Rascal, ND Medical, tr- no, ND Medic 21, North Dakota Medic 21. I bet that's what that is. And Sandra Mabry. Nice. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Then, you, got, you got some spoops? I got some spoops. To Aria, the zebra queen, which by the way, zebras or zebras are my favorite animal. To Aria, the zebra queen, from mother, father, and ebony, happy ninth birthday. Enjoy your birthday to potato, you weirdo. <laughs> to Michael M. F. N. Delarm, from your awesome girlfriend, Devin, happy three-year anniversary, puppy. I love you so much. To Andrea from Babs, happy birthday. I know times are tough, but we always get through it. 
Thanks for believing in us. To Brenda from Holly, to the best boss ever, thank you for being a great boss and friend. We will miss you. Good luck and stay spoopy. To Greg from your mom, Carrie, happy 13th birthday to my favorite creep. I love you, bubs. I love that like every little boy is bubs. Mm -hmm. Uh, To Selena from Jake, happy birthday. Wishing you another spooky year and a year of being scared to death. Aw. That's Uh, it. That's it. And that's our show. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith for scoring today's show. Thanks to Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. To book editor Drew Atana, polishing and preparing listener stories for book number five. Thank you to Sophie Evans for finding the first story I told this week and to Sarah Finch for finding the second. These episodes are on YouTube if you'd like to watch. We're on Facebook and Instagram where we post pics that accompany episodes at Scared to Death Podcasts. And we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, just full of fellow horror lovers. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Happy Halloween or happy Valentine's. <laughs> happy and, Halloween. You know as what? Well. Early, you know? ha- early happy Halloween. Just get it out there so I don't forget. <laughs> Hope you're scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. My mom worked really hard to make me terrified of two things. I know what they are. Black eyes. And getting someone pregnant. Uh, I guess three things. <laughs> Black eyes, getting someone pregnant, and drowning.